In our first reading, we are told that whenever Moses had his arms uplifted in prayer, the children of Israel had the better of the battle. But when he tired and let his arms down, the Israelites started to be overwhelmed by their enemies, the Amalekites. The Catechism of the Catholic Church comments on this very passage. From this intimacy with the faithful God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, Moses drew strength and determination for his intercession. He does not pray for himself, but for the people whom God made his own. Moses already intercedes for them during the battle with the Amalekites and prays to obtain healing for Miriam. But it is chiefly after their apostasy, that is, when the Israelites rebelled against God and fell away from the commandments, that Moses stands in the breach before God in order to save the people. God is love. He is therefore righteous and faithful. He cannot contradict himself. He must remember his marvelous deeds, since his glory is at stake, and he cannot forsake this people that bears his name. Think for a moment of Moses' posture, his arms outstretched in intercession for Israel. It is the same posture as that of Jesus on the cross, interceding for mankind as our great high priest. In union with Christ and conformed to his image, we live and pray in hope, in expectation of the kingdom. Just as Moses was both the liberator of Israel and the lawgiver, so also Christ is inseparably our Redeemer and the giver of the law of the new covenant. As St. Paul wrote to Timothy, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The entirety of the scriptures of both the Old and New Testaments are given that we may be instructed for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, and so that we may be equipped for every good work in his service. Christ himself told us, If you love me, keep my commandments. Many Christians forget that Christ reaffirmed the Ten Commandments for his followers when he said to a young inquirer, If you would enter life, keep the commandments. These commandments are also called the Decalogue, which means the Ten Words. They remain valid and binding for us, too, in the New Covenant. The Decalogue was given directly by God after he had liberated the Israelites from slavery in the land of Egypt. Moses recounted the giving of the law as follows. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness, with a loud voice. And he added no more. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone, and gave them to me. Holy Scripture tells us that the Ten Commandments were written directly with the finger of God upon the two tables, unlike the other commandments written by Moses. These stone tables were called the Tables of Testimony and were deposited in the Ark of the Covenant. These are the Ten Commandments. The First Commandment. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no strange gods before me. The Second Commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Third Commandment. Remember to keep holy the Lord's day. The Fourth Commandment. Honor your father and your mother. The fifth commandment, you shall not kill. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. The seventh commandment, you shall not steal. The eighth commandment, 
you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The Ninth Commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. The Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. The precepts of the Ten Commandments are known, at least in a general way, among all nations, even those who have never been directly influenced by divine revelation. One of the early church fathers, St. Irenaeus, put it this way, From the beginning God had implanted in the heart of man the precepts of the natural law. Then he was content to remind him of them. This was the Decalogue. The Ten Commandments point the way to conduct that befits human dignity and freedom. The Lord said to Moses, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore choose life, that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and cleaving to him. For that means life to you and length of days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. According to St. Augustine, these Ten Commandments in turn are reducible to two, the love of God and of our neighbor, on which depend the whole law and the prophets. When asked which of the commandments was the greatest, our Redeemer replied, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Notice that the love of God comes first, before even the love of neighbor. We live in a humanistic age when the priority of God and of the life of worship and prayer is forgotten. Our Lord warned against this forgetfulness of God and pointedly asked his disciples, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Christ our Savior proclaimed first the love of his Father in heaven, in accord with the teaching of Moses and the prophets. Only then does our Lord say, that the second great commandment is like the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. St. John says that he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. He who loves God should love his brother also. The cross of Jesus Christ makes this truth visible. Consider that the cross has, first, a vertical and ascending dimension, pointing toward heaven. So it speaks of the love of God. The the cross also has a horizontal dimension, with Christ's arms opening wide to all mankind. So it speaks of the love of neighbor. God's ultimate word for our lives is imprinted not on stone tables, but on our Redeemer's humanity, on his very flesh that was sacrificed for us.